Good morning. Everybody has asked you to repeat that out loud, and I'm not going to do that. But I will ask you two things. First, if you would like to stand up and stretch, please go ahead. You know, just get those. All right, all right. Let's, well, you don't have to leave. You can just stand up. You've been sitting for a while, and it's good to do that. You can feel the blood flow in these odd parts of your body, like your fingers. And the second thing is, while you guys are moving and rediscovering your body, quick show of hands: How many of you are on Twitter? And how many of you are on Twitter right now? Oh, very good. Please keep tweeting.、Uh, I am at Brian Alexander, and I would love to hear your thoughts. I'm going to resist the temptation to be on Twitter while talking to you, though. Uh, thank you very, very much for bringing me here.、Um, it is、uh, a very exciting for a lot of reasons.、Uh, I've never been to Singapore before, but this gives me the opportunity to say hello from the United States. This is me in my native habitat. This is also me in my native habitat. It is a little chilly right now. It warmed up to one degree, which is a good idea for us in November. So I'm very glad to be in Singapore, indeed. For the next half hour. I'm going to be speaking about the future of education. I'm going to be talking about the world, although my bias is going to be slightly towards the United States, as well as slightly towards higher education. So, quick show of hands: How many of you are in primary and secondary education? How many of you are in tertiary? How many of you are in none of the above? Brave people. Good. Excellent. As I go, I'm going to be covering a lot of terrain. Please don't be shy with questions at the end, and if you're on Twitter, fire a comment away. So to begin with, we're going to be talking about the human side of technology and education. There are a lot of different trends and forces to talk about. This is a shot of my main trend map.、It、has about 86 different trends. And you can see they include everything from education and technology to technology per se. Today we're going to focus on the social and human contexts, as well as how educators have responded. So for right now, everything we think about technology that we've been hearing this morning, that we're going to be talking about over the next few days, hold on to that for now. Think about augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, which, by the way, could completely redefine computing as we know it. Mobile computing, 3D printing. Just hang on to that for a second. We're not going to dive into that. Instead, we're going to talk about the human realm. So, to begin with, I'd like to isolate some major trend lines, forces that are changing education worldwide. Next. We'll take a look at reactions and how education has already changed for that. Then we'll try to glimpse what a university or a school might look like down the road a bit. A major trend, and this has come up already. Our HP friend described how globalization, globalization on steroids, is a major, major force. This is obviously important in general, but in particular in education. We are witnessing right now the rise of a global, transnational market for higher education. None of us have really planned this out too far. It's a really, really exciting and powerful development to see, and we can break it down in a few levels. One of them is that across the planet, international systems of education have been building up. If you go to Europe, Germany, 15 years ago, spent several billion euro simply to improve their universities. If you go to the rest of Europe, and by Europe I'm including Greenland and Russia, they built a higher education area so that you can exchange credits from Portugal to Moscow very, very easily. In fact, more easily than you can move across the United States. We also have China right now, which has built more higher education capacity, indeed more education capacity, more quickly, possibly than any civilization in human history to date. There's an extraordinary amount of growth right now. The second part is that we have more international students enrolling around the world. So we have people who are traveling to Finland, to Japan, to Singapore, to the United States, to Canada. Canada right now gets more international students per capita than anybody else. This is a very, very powerful development. It will probably just keep growing.、Now、on top of that, some nations are opening branch campuses or other institutions abroad. Just down the street from us, we have Yale University from the United States, which has a little college in NUS.
put all these together, we have a very, very different higher education world than we used to have. Second major force. Uh, quick show of hands. How many of you are over 50 years old? It's okay, you see the hands went up kind of slowly. People are like, yeah, I feel older just raising my hand now. How many of you are under 30? Okay, so the hands went up more quickly. This, yes, kids, hello, welcome. How many of you are between those ages? All right, all right, we have a nice demographic range here. We have all generations represented. We can make all kinds of cultural references and jokes and tease each other pretty well. Behind me is a representation of what you might look like. This is a demographic analysis of one nation. It's a kind of layer cake. Every horizontal slice is one population. So the very bottom is people aged zero to four, babies, toddlers, then five to nine, then 10 to 14. And you can see from this country that the pattern is a pyramid. At the very base, we are terrific at sending out lots of babies. We spam the environment with teenagers. And then mortality sets in year by year, decade by decade. This is Nigeria a couple of years ago. This is the pattern of most of the developing world. And this is also what human history looked like up until the mid 20th century. In contrast, is Japan. They've taken that pyramid and inverted it. Now, there are a couple of really powerful reasons for this. One is one of the great developments of our time that we should all be celebrating is huge developments in allied health, medical science, public health that let us live longer. Previous speakers have mentioned this, and it's truly extraordinary. There are many people alive today who would have been dead just 20 years ago, but for advances in medical science. That's tremendous. And the second reason is all of you. We know from UN studies that the more education girls and women get, the fewer kids they have in the later in life. So the global push towards more and more education has really changed the demographics of the planet. So we look at Japan, and you begin to understand, among other things, why that country is so much in love with robots, because they are running out of workers. This pattern is replicated in other countries around the world. This is what Northern Europe looks like. Italy is heading this way. Parts of my country look that way. In fact, my country is a little anomalous. I call this the refrigerator diagram because it looks kind of like a refrigerator. You see, we don't have that triangle anymore. This is shocking, by the way, to the United States that sees itself as a young nation, a nation of youth and vitality. If we removed immigration from this chart, it would look more like Japan. So what you see are two very, very different national models for the world. You see advanced countries, OECD countries, and then you see the rest. It's possible that for OECD countries, they will now market themselves to the developing world more aggressively. For example, Africa right now is the world's gold mine for young people and teenagers. Are we gonna see universities from Finland from Massachusetts, from Quebec, aggressively recruiting from Kenya, from Somalia, that's one possibility. Demographics are enormously influential. Let me keep going. We can talk about economics for the next three days. There are a lot of forces here. I just want to pull out a couple. First, in the Anglophonic countries, so Australia, Canada, the US, Britain, we've been experiencing rising income inequality. And this has happened across the board. If you look at this chart here, the very far left starts with around 1900, 1910. The vertical axis measures income inequality. The higher, the more unequal, right? And you can see that from around 1914 to the middle of the 20th century, we became less unequal. And then, starting around 1980, inequality took off again. And we are now circa 1910, 1920 levels. These countries are talking about themselves as a new gilded age. And this changes everything about education. It changes the funding model of schools. It changes the jobs that kids are going to go for. And in fact, in my country, there's school after school that describes themselves as basically being the schools for the 1%. Go here, and you will join the elite. That's one business model. Meanwhile, the labor world is changing even more rapidly. And these developments are so, so important for all of you in this room. To begin with, we have this idea 
Well, let me back up. Overall, the globe is moving from agriculture and manufacturing towards manufacturing, towards service, and the information economy. And what we do with manufacturing, we're doing more and more with robots. So we're seeing a whole new way of work appear. And it's one that surprises us in a lot of ways. One key part of that is the old vision whereby people could work for one employer, for one career, for life, is going away. And instead, we work multiple jobs, multiple employers, multiple careers, sometimes simultaneously and overlapping. In the US, we call this the gig economy. In Australia, they call this the American economy. You're welcome. I'm so glad I could give you these things. Um, but that changes education. When we talk about lifelong learning, or the way that we, students have to dip back into school decade after decade to reskill or learn more about themselves, now we really have to do it. Now, on top of this, we have automation. Automation, for the first time, it's possible that we will have underemployment and unemployment as a result of technological innovation. This is an enormous change. That's one that we really have to think hard about. Now, I apologize on behalf of my country for this slide. Politics. We have hyperglobalization, as our friend from HP mentioned, right? But we also have the reverse. And not just this guy, but we have anti immigrant drives in the United Kingdom in Hungary, in Poland, in Austria. We also saw it in Germany, of all places, as well as France. And we see mutters of that around the world. It's a kind of dialectical movement. While we have more and more globalization, finally we have the reverse. And this matters for you, because it's possible, depending on where you are, that you may see less migration. You may see criticism of students that are from another place. We have to have this policy framework in mind. More than that, the political tension can be quite extreme. For example, I mentioned immigration, but we also have the dynamic of intergenerational tension. Now, think about this for a second. First, if you look at the demographics of who voted for Brexit and who voted for Trump, it tended to be people over 55. If you look at the support for staying in the European Union or the opposition to Trump, it tends to be under 30. So we have an interesting generational gap opening wide. Those generations also have very different technological habits, so they may be occupying different worlds completely. Moreover, if you think about people who are under 20 right now, you think about the kids from high tech high, you think about the planet they're inheriting. It's one where global climate change is accelerating. We all know it, and we're, as a whole, as a species, we're not slowing it down very much. It's got to be interesting to be 15 and inherit a planet like that. When we add urbanization, as both speakers before me mentioned, we might have a future like the one Bruce Sterling articulated. The future could be old people in big cities afraid of the sky. A great phrase to think about. And not the world that you grew up in. And not the world we are trained to teach in. Meanwhile, we also have political drivers trying to reform education, whether education wants it or not. And this happens across the world, and for different purposes, for quality concerns, for fears about safety, for fears about technology, and those pressures keep going and aren't slowing down. Now, we also have been experimenting a bit, we're going to talk more about this in a little while, but we have alternative certification models, like competency-based learning and badges. We also have alternative, alternative business models, like coding academies, MOOCs, or even new projects like Minerva or Mission U, trying to outflank education and give us new forms. Meanwhile, in education, in some countries, and again, here's my American bias, we're shifting our workforce from full-time to part-time, from tenure to precarity. In the United States now, the largest population of university instructors are part-timers who are paid below minimum wage. How many of you work in libraries? Show of hands. Ah, nobody? Oh, no, there's one. All right. Hello. Where are you from? Welcome. I'm glad to see you. How does the library world change in the middle of all of this? Well, there are a few ways. I mean, one is that libraries may shift away from collection development. Their old purpose of accumulating the wonderful artifacts of human history may be sliding to one side. Instead, 
They become your gurus, your Sherpas, to trying to understand the information world as information becomes more and more unreliable. Second problem, come back to demographics again. If you poll older people around the world and you ask them, what is a library? They say, this is where books are. Now, when they go to the library, they might not check out books. They may check out DVDs, but they think of books. If you ask younger people, they say a library is a place where you can have technology, where you can get online, maybe where you can buy coffee, maybe where kids can play. We have two very, very different modes of what a library is. It's possible one will fade away. Now, if we don't have librarians being paid attention to anymore, they might leave the building and go out into the world and become information entrepreneurs, track down businesses that need knowledge. I got this last point from a wonderful librarian from China who argued that's going to be the dominant way of libraries going forward. Now, the population who comes to education, this is very, very interesting. Let me give you a little US slice of the pie. First of all, we have something like 40% of our college students now are adults. This is very, very new. Increasingly, the 18 to 22 year old population will become a minority. The second thing is a lot of them are first generation college students. That is, their parents did not go to college or university. That gives them a disadvantage in trying to navigate university life. On top of that, primary, secondary, tertiary school students, we have an outbreak of an increasing number of students with learning disabilities of all kinds, treated by technology or by medication. We don't know the reason for this, but it's interesting. And then, last but not least, the United States has been fighting a global war for almost 20 years. Our veterans keep going back to colleges and universities. We're still grappling with how best to teach and support them. Now, I mentioned before the growing number of people who've gone through education. One of the United Nations goals, one of the goals of a lot of nonprofits, is to get more and more girls and women through higher education. And we've succeeded in that. In fact, we have large numbers of women going to college and university, which is tremendous. In fact, in the US, it's a majority. It's a striking majority. And if you ever pay attention to American college sports, like football or basketball, one of the reasons some schools produce those now is to try and get more boys and men at the colleges and universities. Now, I mentioned all these students going to university. Interesting stat. For the past five years, the total number of students enrolled in American colleges and universities has gone down. This hasn't happened since the 1970s. This is very, very disturbing, especially since most of our budgets come from tuition dollars. This is a little tricky. Now, it's possible that American higher ed is overbuilt, which might be an opportunity for you if you're sending kids to there, so please consider this as an option. Also in that enrollment is this interesting pattern, and you've heard hints of that from our speakers so far, which is that you're seeing a decline in the number of students majoring in the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences, and a rise in those studying the sciences of all kinds, all of STEM, plus especially biology and the life sciences. That's a major, major shift. It's a hard shift to make, but it's really happening in a big way. So it stopped. If we had a little more time, I would stop and ask you, think about all these trends I've just hurled in your direction. Some of you have been tweeting about this. I want to see what you said. Then ask yourself two questions. In your own work, if you're at a startup, a primary school, a large business, a university, or a library, think which of these trends is the most powerful. It's likeliest to shape the next decade of your enterprise. Then think of this trickier question. Which of these is the hardest to predict? Which of these is a wild card, an asterisk? Now, I want to wrap a few of these trends together and see what they tell us. And one way of wrapping these together is to talk about a crisis or a bubble. Let me just outline this. The possibility of a bubble comes from things like this. I don't know if you can read this magazine title. This is one of the most boring, non-hype-oriented magazines on Earth. All Consumer Reports does is look at products and figure out if they're any good, and they tell you about them. That's it. They're wonderful. And they ran this article, major front page, wondering that college might not be worth it anymore. It's an interesting symbol, because we have a lot of people worried about the quality of higher education and also worried about its cost. We also have political pressure around the world 
to make universities better, then we have some unique problems. In the United States, law schools are losing students like mad. The total number of students enrolled in law school has just fallen off a cliff. We've seen MBA schools threatening to close. The amount of public funding, see this is an interesting thing. We don't have federal funding, we don't have central government funding to the United States higher education system or to K through 12. We have state funding. And state funding for universities has declined for the past 30 years. How do we pay for it? Well, we've invented a new way of paying for higher education. I'll just share it with you. It's called going massively into debt. The average student who leaves American colleges and universities owes roughly $30,000. The total amount of the debt right now, I don't know if you can quite see this, is roughly $1.4 trillion and growing still. Uh, I am 50 years old. I'm still paying off debt for my PhD. I may pay it off when I die. I don't know yet. America has innovated this. You can use this idea or discard it if you like. But that's our idea. That makes us terrified. It makes us very, very nervous. In fact, some colleges have responded with what I call the queen's sacrifice. If you know in chess, when you're playing chess, you can give up your most powerful piece, your queen, in order to make a staggering win. Well, we've seen some colleges and universities close academic programs like foreign languages or education in the hope that they can save money and survive. But it might not all be so grim and threatening. We have something called the college premium. And this means if you go to college, if you go to university and get a degree, you will make a certain amount of money more than if you didn't. How much more? Roughly half a million dollars. If you go into debt for 30,000, half a million is a nice payoff. This is what keeps us going. Now, all these changes, all these forces, all these trends have pushed education back and forth. How have we responded? There are a few ways. And by the way, this isn't a Photoshop photo. This is an actual photograph from Canada. The uh, gentleman's wife took this photo to try and encourage him to come inside. <laughs> One is the notion of digital literacy. That is, we think of ways to teach students of all ages to become more thoughtful, more skeptical consumers of digital information and better producers of it. That is, they know how to sift fact from fiction, they know how to understand hoaxes, and they know when to share the results with other people. Now, this is a global movement. There are many, many projects from the Middle East to Switzerland to Canada through Russia. This is a really, really interesting movement. This is just one piece of evidence from UNESCO, which offers five laws that are pretty interesting, where they think learners of all kinds have certain abilities and laws. That's one way forward, to teach people to be more critical consumers. Now, that happens in part because of our fear of fake news, which is understandable. But also, we have this sense, let me just go back one, The law number three at the top states that information, knowledge, and messages are not always value neutral or always independent of biases. Quite true. So to understand it, maybe we need an understanding of politics and social forces. Another way educators have been responding is with maker movements. And we've seen examples that before from the, you know, from high tech high to, uh, uh, Adrian's example is a wonderful project built by students. In fact, we've been arguing on Twitter about some of them. But the maker movement is really interesting. I just want to say a couple of words about it. One is that it is horizontal and it's pedagogy. You don't have a master maker who teaches you everything. Instead, you go and you learn with peers, you learn online, you put things together. The second is that it involves a variety of technologies, from the high-tech 3D printers to the low-tech of sheet metal and wood. Third point. If you live in an area that is deindustrializing, this lets students connect with the old industrial population. Now, students make stuff in a maker space. They make robots, they make alarms, they make software. But this is new for us to think about. If we imagine that all students are producers, that all students are content owners, <laughs> that all students are copyright holders, this changes education in some interesting ways, doesn't it? It means that schools 
are in effect platforms for publishing content. It means that if I'm thinking about applying to your high school, I might look at your website and look at the student work that you're showcasing there. On top of this, we can get even more radical. How many of you have experimented with digital storytelling? Ah, oh, good, keep those hands up. Look at those people, if you haven't raised your hand, those are the innovative people with heart and ambition. They will now be picked on mercilessly for the next two days, which is good, which is fine. Digital storytelling is a movement which has ordinary people make stories using digital tools. And the digital tool can be a podcast, it can be a video, it can be a Twitter stream, it can be a blog. If a student makes a digital story, they have to integrate what they've been experiencing in their class. If it's a biology class or a French class, then they have to rethink about it and represent it as a story, as a narrative. There's serious cognitive gains here. Storytelling is a powerful pedagogy. Now, another way we respond is with chaos and insurgency. I mean, you think about it. If you're teaching students to become makers and producers, if you're teaching students to be critical consumers, if you're helping them use mobile devices and social media to think, they might organize. They might take steps against you. And you might not approve of this. And we've seen this in different countries. We saw South Africa. We saw students protesting against textbook prices. And they protested and organized so effectively that Pearson lost a ton of money and had to lay people off. We saw in Canada and in Britain, students organize against high fees and block them to some degree. In my country, we see students organizing against racism and gender discrimination. One side effect of everything we're talking about is students dissenting is students organizing. Now, another response we have is the digital humanities movement. A few minutes ago, I mentioned that enrollment in STEM fields is rising and enrollment in humanities is declining. Well, in those shrinking humanities, there are humanists who've decided to take a look at old humanities topics. What is being? What is meaning? What is in a text? by using new technologies, everything from text mapping to data analysis to new methodologies. Now, beyond that, we have the open movement. And by open, I mean open access and scholarly publication, open education resources, and even open source software for higher education or education in general. And the open movement has been incrementally advancing, creating more content, winning more adherence. Now, if we take all these together, and we try and imagine what a school would look like in five years or 10 years, we can extrapolate and have a little sense of it. So let me just pull out a few points. One is you have to imagine schools that are deeply transnational, like here in Singapore. Imagine schools in China, imagine schools in Russia, schools in Uganda, schools in Canada, where when you set foot there, you hear multiple languages, you see multiple ethnicities and religions. Let's assume that's the default where schools become the theater for globalization. Moreover, imagine in higher education, in universities, the average age of student is 40. Imagine what a campus looks like for that. Yeah, you have 20-year-olds and 70-year-olds at the same time. Beyond that, imagine the faculty teaching are paid by the hour. They don't have a full-time gig. Instead, they just work part-time and are paid per hour of engagement. Moreover. Imagine that the number of private universities in the world decline, it grows, the number of public universities, state-supported ones, shrinks, that we get more and more privatization. And between those institutions, we have campuses that are very, very different. We have some campuses that are enormously wealthy, like Harvard, that we just heard about, that have tremendous buildings and lots of staff and great technology. And then we have schools that operate on a shoestring that can barely keep the lights on. That whole range of income inequality plays out institutionally. Beyond that, think about technology a little bit. Every school becomes a rich multimedia environment with augmented reality classes, with virtual reality explorations, with students, faculty, and staff using mixed reality to engage with non-tangible products, with 3D printers printing tangible products. That's a changed environment in a lot of ways. Some of that's gamified. We have students playing games as part of learning or learning modified by points and roles and so on. Students are producers. Students show off their work. 
Schools show off their work. They publish the 18-year-olds and the 60-year-olds' work. There's an always-on ecosystem of content where there's always access to peers, to teachers, to other students, to content, and the ability to produce more. And beyond that, the minute a student sets foot in a classroom or they log on to your class online, they start generating data with every quiz they take, with every question they answer, with every reading they do. And that data is extensive. This leads to widespread analysis. Every student becomes massively surveyed. And school after school invents new methods for making sense, making information of all that data. That sounds a little bit science fictional. I would date that to maybe 2018, maybe 2019. How do you get there? How do you guys in this room respond? Well, I have a few pieces of advice. One is to collaborate with each other in all kinds of ways, across nations, across sectors, across professions, across disciplines. This is the best way to proceed. A lot of what we're doing now is uncharted and strange. The best way to advance into it most effectively is with friends and colleagues. The second is to use social media to the extent that you can. It can be dangerous. You may see things in YouTube that you wish you died rather than ever having seen. You may have people on Facebook that you would rather not talk to. Use it well and use it to share what you learn. Use Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, Tencent, anything you can to share what your discoveries are so that other people can benefit and we can grow collaboratively. Also, as far as you can, be open. Use open content and share what you have. And then think about automation. Think about how anything around you might be automated. Grading, class assignment, interaction with students, finding new readings. And then think of these guys. These are 14 and 15 year olds. They had an assignment. They had to look in their community for a historical building. They had to map it out, model it three dimensions, and then print it out for a contest. I look at these kids and think, they didn't grow up with so much that we know. And this technology for them is not science fictional. This technology is simply more technology they can use. I think about what they learned, what their expectations are. They are why we are here. We have to rethink everything based on what they have in their eyes and their hearts. We have to imagine what they will inherit. We have to imagine the different worlds, what they will inhabit, that you will inhabit, and their children. That imagination is your most powerful tool, and I wish you the joy of exercising it here. Now, every presentation on PowerPoint ends with a URL. I don't know if you know this. It's built in. You absolutely have to do this. That's a joke, you may laugh. But if you would like to take a look and learn more about these trends, here are two links. One is to my major site for all this, the other is to me on Twitter. Now, I believe we've just run over the edge of time, so we don't have time for questions. But I'll be here for the next two days, and I would love to hear from you. Thank you very much.